thank you all um, for, for joining us. Um, my name's Adam Graham. I run uh, Grey Matters. We're a business development consultancy and essentially help agencies mentor them and empower them to, to win new business. And often on that journey, we get asked a lot about um, businesses who, who want to sell um, and want to exit or looking through acquisition for growth. And for, for our job on that behalf is mainly about helping them build their brand, helping them build awareness of their agency, helping them build a sustainable pipeline. And that's obviously all very attractive uh, to a buyer. Um, but I want to do this event, bring together some people who have actually been through um, uh, an M&A process and bring you their experiences and understand the decisions they've made. Uh, so I'll introduce the panel uh, shortly. Um, and just to, just to start us off, um, I've also got alongside me um, Will, who runs a M&A uh, partnership called WY. Um, and I've invited him to, to join me on some of the questions to the panel today. Um, and also to kick us off with just sharing an overview of sort of how the M&A market um, currently looks. So if it's all right with you, Will, I will yep. hand over to you quickly. Yep. Thanks, Adam. So hi, everyone. So I, I run WY Partners. We're a, a M&A advisory practice. We work in the media and technology space. We work across buy side and sell side. So I can give you our perspective of what we've kind of seen and how we see things panning out. Um, so certainly we've, we've seen um, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, you know, M&A stalled somewhat in the early stages. Buyers pulled back, waited to see what was happening. Investors turned inward and, and looked at their own portfolio businesses. Um, but demand has certainly picked up. I think S4 has just announced another deal today. Uh, Mighty Hives acquired a business called Bright Blue. Uh, so, so we've we've seen a particular increase in appetite from private equity houses, uh, as as strategic acquirers have hesitated a little bit, um, and they've been looking at both kind of direct investments to invest some of the cash they've got, and also making acquisitive targets to um, to add on to their portfolio businesses, um, and they've been looking at businesses, I guess, that are succeeding through the uncertainty of COVID, and also businesses that might be might present you know, um, valuable acquisitions in times of uncertainty where, where the price might be, might be down. Um, so we expect the outlook of m to continue to kind of remain strong. Um, buyers and investors are sitting on a reasonable amount of cash and good businesses are always going to remain attractive investments. Um, and I guess the final kind of snippet on the, on the kind of landscape is that we don't think we've ever seen the market to be quite as big as it is. So we've got We've got the kind of the original bigger groups, which are all struggling and, and declining, but we expect we'll be picking up the m and to, to counter some of that revenue decline. There's the new challenger groups that are coming along, like um, S4 and you and Mr. Jones. And then there's, you know, the, the, the private equity investors are, are looking at the industry like, like never before. So, yeah. Great. Th thanks for that, Will. So um, just to bring the panelists then. So firstly, we've got um, James Spot. So James set up um, the ASO company uh, just four years ago. So specializing in app store optimization, um, as well as Apple search ads and mobile strategy. And that was with one sort of strong belief that optimizing your current assets is just as important as promoting um, your existing business. So the agency grew at a uh, phenomenal pace uh, from over two to over 30 people in a short space of time. And he sold that business to Jellyfish in 2019 and went on to be their chief solutions officer in mobile. Um, Jane Rutter is um, set up digital and creative agency in, in, called Zeal uh, 10 years ago in Leeds. Um, you know, she loves digital, showing clients exactly what each penny of their advertising budget is going to do to their bottom line. And earlier this year, Zeal acquired bespoke tech firm at Metrics, uh, boosting innovation and promoting growth. And then lastly, Dan Gilbert set up Brain Labs in 2012. Um, he's uh, been on a mission to make marketing more scientific since uh, his birth and since then has doubled in size every year using data and automation um, to drive clients growth in paid search, display, paid social, SEO, CRO, analytics. Um, and in 2019, um, LivingBridge made an investment into Brain Labs to support its acquisition growth strategy. Uh, last year, they took a step towards what they define as the agency model of the future by combining forces with SEO experts Distilled and US-based PPC leaders Hannapin and expanding their office footprint across the US. 
So that's who we've got on the panel for us. So let's get started um, and we'll go to you firstly, James, if that's all right. Um, so obviously you grew at speed there. What, what do you think the key to that speed was? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, I think for us, it was all about having a very clear focus on what we actually wanted to achieve. In fact, you said it when you introduced me, you know, we were all about optimizing. We, we believe that optimizing your assets is just as important as basically spending money. And we kind of identified that, you know, a lot of agencies do a lot of things, which is fine. But, you know, you'll go onto an agency website and a lot of the time you'll see maybe 20 to 30 different services and processes that, that they are capable of doing. Um, whereas we did it the opposite way around. We basically, you know, you mentioned three things there, but really we only did one thing when we started, uh, which was app optimization, uh, which is something that not many agencies did at all. And for a good two and a half years, many clients asked us to do lots of different things for them. Uh, and we always said no, which I was really pleased about because had we have said yes, 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 then I think we would have diluted our proposition and our growth definitely would have stalled. Um, so I think just having that really clear focus and um, going out to market with just one thing that we knew people needed um, and you know, we, we knew there was a gap there anyway. Uh, and you know, once we defined the actual proposition, when we actually went to market, it, it, it literally just went went a bit nuts um but the kind of nuts bit you know was not an organic nuts we had um i would say quite an aggressive outbound sales strategy um in the previous agency that i'd worked at we also had quite an aggressive outbound sales strategy and um you know we're proud of that i think a lot of agencies might have small bd teams or you know, everything grows organically and certainly with the bigger agencies, it's through intermediaries or, or whatever that might be. Um, but for us, you know, we wanted to hit the ground running. Uh, we knew we had a great product um, and we, we immediately hired salespeople to go out to market and, and pretty much speak to every single person that we, that we thought. I mean, there's three million apps in the app store and we literally just went through them all. Did you, did you, um, plan, you, know, did you plan to sell from the beginning? Um, well, I've had prior businesses that have been through a similar uh, type of situation. So I think in the back of my mind, honestly, yes, I think we always wanted to sell it. Um, selling it that quickly, I don't think we realized was going to happen. Um, but, you know, I think the, the reason why we were able to sell quickly, which actually ties into the, the first question, which is how did we grow quickly? is that we kind of palmed off the people per hour business model and pretty much productized what we were doing straight away. So if you want ASO, this is the fixed cost and this is the deliverables at the end. So every single client that we had basically was at the same level of profitability, which allowed us to not only you know, be profitable really quickly, but also to invest more in the team, to invest more in the sales team, and of course, invest a lot more into the process, which at the time uh, was very, very immature in terms of you know, ASO. We, we didn't really know, we knew what we were doing, but not as much as, you know, as we did a couple of years later. Um, so yeah, we, we, we did know, I think we did know that we wanted to sell, but not, not as quickly. Cool. And, uh... Thanks, James. And Dan, um, so you, you took investment from LivingBridge. Was that your, was private equity always your preferred, preferred route as a strategic partner? Uh, no, I mean, not at the beginning, no. Um, when we began a process, uh, it was a process of discovery, so finding out what was out there in terms of options. And, uh, you know, we met with uh, a lot of different companies, uh, 22 if I remember correctly from the beginning, um, and, and when we started, it was, it was sort of actually had private equity in there as a bit of a, an unknown backup choice, if I'm honest, and not doing any disservice to, to private equity. It was just that I didn't really know much about it at the beginning. As I learned more and more about what private equity is and what it isn't, it encouraged me that that was the right route for our business to go down at the time. So for, for Brain Labs, based on uh, 
where we had got to and what we wanted to keep doing, it was it was a perfect partner. Um, uh, and that's again no, no uh, disservice to any of the networks. Like there was some there was some great opportunities in and amongst those. It was just that. Uh, private equity gave us a route to, to pursuing our own path and then pursuing down this kind of m a driven route and and dan what why did you choose living bridge um in the end like you know what was your kind of criteria or what were you thinking uh well i mean there was there was a there was a brilliant cultural alignment between us and living bridge and they had this track record of investing in services businesses and i think stood apart from many of the other private equity houses in understanding that that um in service businesses people are the product to a certain extent like as in the, the people deliver the service and therefore uh, culture is a key driver of value in a services business and living bridge really understood that and and you could see that within their own business within the within the way that they approached uh, uh, their portfolio and the way that they spoke about business um, so they were they were perfect for us and they were the right size and had the right kind of speciality and track record ultimately uh, when it's when it first started differentiating one private equity house from another when you're not in that market is really quite difficult. Yeah. Uh, but by the time and now on the other, on the other side, it's probably like agency land to a certain extent, right? Like you know, living bridge are very, very different to many of their peers. Yeah. Uh, I think better. Uh, they have a, they have probably the best track record in the industry. And that was important to me because you know, we're one of their portfolio and we want to be successful as a business. So they're, they're getting something right. Uh, and I wanted part of that. So, uh, so far, it's been it's been absolutely the right decision, and they've they've been a brilliant partner. Cool, cool. Okay, and then bringing Jane in, then. So obviously, you decided to go down the the acquisition route. Um, why why is that? Why did you decide it was right to sort of acquire another agency? And I was interested if COVID played a role in in that decision as well. Possibly, yeah. I think it, it was just a desire for change. Really, um, I'd been running Zeal for ten years. Um, highs and lows. I'd grown it to about 30 people. We lost a major client. We shrank down a little bit. Um, and I felt like um, felt like I was treading water a little bit. Um, and, you know, I had those conversations with myself of what am I doing this for and why am I doing it? And, and, and then COVID does, I think, or did make me reassess what I wanted out of my life a little bit, what I wanted out of business. Um, and actually, it I actually started down the selling route. So um, I actually thought, do you know what? I want to sell either part of it or all of it. And uh, and, and kind of, I'd become a little bit, I think, um, disenchanted with it all. And it felt a lot like a burden instead of a great part of my life that it had been for the past 10 years. So yeah, I started um, down the I'm going to sell route and then just went 18 and thought, no, I'm going to buy it. So, um, it, was, it, was, it was very much a personality thing and very much a meeting the right person at the right time, which was completely, my mind was that some, I, would, I would sell part of it. And then I met Rob, the guy that owns Appmetrics at a round table event. Um, we started kind of cross-referring work. There's a massive affinity between the kind of clients we wanted to attract, huge uh, affinity between the culture and how we both run our agencies. Um, and actually we got on really well as well and communicated really well. So it started by, uh, we were going to sublet some desks to him because obviously we have a huge office that nobody can use for like five, six months. Um, and then actually we said, well, should we do something a bit more meaningful? Um, and, and yeah, that's where it started. So it was, it was driven by a personal need for change. It was driven by a professional need that I felt Zeal had lost its way a bit and wasn't growing as fast as it should do. Um, and, and also it came from a, a place where I'd, I'd been doing this on my own for 10 years and felt like I needed somebody to come into the business to actually take a little bit of the pressure off and, and put that kind of excitement and drive back in because I'd, I'd probably lost it for, for a while. Yeah, and I'm sure there's many agency owners who could probably empathise with that and in a you know, very similar position. Um, and like any good relationship started with you sort of you know, getting to know each other. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, and, and just interesting then in terms of the, the proposition, um, you know, and what app, app metrics brings to Zill, what, what does that look like from, how does that benefit the clients and what did you think that would bolster to your current offering? Yeah, so one of the things that we've been doing is we've been moving away, so we, we, we do a lot of kind of um, web builds, but actually we started doing a lot more platform builds and, and, and putting tech as the, 
uh, a lot more into like the center of the vision. Um, we did two, we built kind of two platforms before AppMetrics. One went amazingly, like hugely profitable, amazingly profitable for the client. It was just an absolute dream. And then one went absolutely disastrously wrong, cost me about 70 grand and was just um, a real, real pain point. Um, and so uh, it was something that, especially with COVID, this kind of digitalization and people actually looking to move traditionally offline services online, um, you need more than just a website to do that. You need the kind of like um, app uh, development, web apps, uh, but also like actually kind of backend platform applications, which is what app metrics really focused on. So um, yeah, that just allows us to expand the range of development that we offer clients. It allows us more resource because I was always, always under resource from a dev team point of view. Um, still are now ironically but we've just had like our best month in the past probably over since, since we lost our, our major client which has been great and everybody's busy we've got five roles out for hire so it feels like um you know this was the right move and the clients are the clients that we're getting are now the clients that we want so we've been really we've kind of shifted um a load of focus on the kind of clients that we work with as well so Clients will have to be able to pass a certain, obviously we won't ask them this outright, but they will have to pass a certain a checklist for us to be the right agency for them. And if they don't pass that checklist, then we'll pass them on to agencies that we think are better suited. But we're looking for like clients that are wanting to grow quickly and um, have investment to do that, see our value. Um, and, and yeah, that kind of um, change in vision has been really important. And that's happened since AppMetrics and since the acquisition. Yeah, so that sounds exciting and, and, and sensible to be qualifying. You know, sounds like you've got a, a new sense of direction for who you are as a business and, and the yeah. kind of clients you want to work with, essentially. Yeah, I think like a lot of agencies, especially if we, following the, the loss of the, the big client, honestly, people would say, can you do this? I'd say yes and figure out how to do it later. Um, and that, you know, I, I, we needed the revenue, so I'm not kind of ashamed to say that, uh, but it's definitely the wrong way to do it. And, and now, um, you know, now we have this kind of, really strong vision of what we do what we're good at and who we want to do it for it's actually made sales a lot easier like i've been on calls where i've kind of been saying do you know what we're probably not the right partner for you and they're like oh no we'll change we'll be the right partner so it's like it's actually like really it's really nice it's a lot better to do that but obviously um it's not easy to you know just go out and fire a load of your clients that you you think are shit just to jump in yeah, I, I mean, it's music to my ears hearing, you know, hearing you say that, Jane, because, you know, I think every single agency is guilty of just saying yes to absolutely everything. And it is, it is, it, you know, that is the way to really spiral down. I think um, that process of, of qualifying business that's right for your agency is absolutely vital. I mean, it's, and, and even if it's a big company, like we, we had in the past, very big brands, but really small budgets. And you sort of like, yeah, but it's a massive brand, but actually you're going to get, in fact, you'll probably end up losing money. Um, and I think, you know, it's all right to do that a couple of times because it's nice to have a logo on the website and it does look good and it, and it can help with new business. But, you know, just saying yes, 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 in, in my opinion, I think is really the, the totally wrong thing to do. And I think that qualification process is the key to, to growing profitably um, and successfully and keeping the team staff morale up as well. I mean, you lose clients just as quickly as you win them, um, which again, for the whole company culture, is just it's just no good. So I, I completely agree with with what you just said there, Jane. I think that's yeah. really important. And obviously, um, James, you you were kind of quite ruthlessly focused with the with the proposition of the agency, and I presume you know that was what was attractive to Jellyfish and 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 sort of what they what they saw in you. You know, how did that sort of come about? Was that like a was that what they were looking for? Or was that kind of like, whoa, they, they never saw this coming? Yeah. Well, well the, the funny thing is, is, um, you know, four years ago, three, four years ago, I, you, only people in mobile marketing would actually know what app, store, what app store optimization actually is or was. Like the industry just didn't know what it, just didn't know that it even existed. Um, and, and basically including jellyfish. So, um, I think we're probably going to talk about this later, but it's a good segue into it. I mean, we we went through a proper process with Will, um, who's from WI, is also on, on here. And, 
Yeah, the will identified jellyfish as being a good partner for us. Uh, and it wasn't just for, for ASO, it was for mobile in general. So the way that we, co you know, we complemented them massively, not just on the app optimization side, uh, but also on the general mobile market, market process and services knowledge base as well. Um, and on the flip side, you know, we, we didn't have any plans to actually offer you know, SEO or program, you know, any of the services, but obviously as being part of Jellyfish, we knew that we wouldn't have to actually do that. But every time someone said, can you do this? Can you do that? You know, we wouldn't have to either turn it down and be thinking, oh, you know, we've just turned away business. We knew we could actually, um, you know, pass it straight on to, to Jellyfish. So the actual matching of us and Jellyfish um, was pretty much perfect in terms of uh, complementary services um, and company ethos and, and, and those sorts of things. But to back to the original question about the proposition, absolutely. I mean, the proposition, in my opinion, is the most important. You know, I think I spent a lot of time at another agency prior to setting this one up and you go on to pitches and basically everyone's selling the same thing. And then when everyone's selling the same thing with slightly different tweaks here and, you know, we've got a better system or we've got a piece of technology that does that. I think, I think that's fine, but a lot of the time it can be whether or not they actually want to work with you. You know, it is a, it is a people business. And when you've got two companies um, selling the same thing, it, it boils down to, do you want to work with them? And what are the fees? Whereas with app store optimization, the competition was so small that it wasn't like, oh, do we want to work with someone else? You know, we were in a very fortunate position whereby our competitors, of which there were some, uh, the way that we saw it, you know, weren't a patch on kind of what our proposition was. So the proposition for us was, was absolutely key, uh, not just in terms of growth, but definitely in terms of finding, you know, someone to acquire us. Um, you know, there's a, there are a lot of businesses out there and I think, you know, standing out from the crowd and having something, you know, not unique or a specific um, you know, proposition, I think is, is really, really important. Okay. I don't think necessarily that when we went, when we went and spoke to Jellyfish, that they were they were looking for an ASO business, right? Um, no, not so at all. That, like, I guess that, that kind of segues into the next question to Dan. That how, how do you go about um, identifying acquisition opportunities? Or how do you see like you know yourself mapping the market to identify what works for you? I think it probably ties in with with some of what uh, Jane and James have said already. Like there's there were two principal drivers for us, which is vertical specialization or geographical presence. So in the two acquisitions, two mergers that we did, uh, one was Distilled, which is an, uh, an SEO specialist agency with offices in Seattle, New York, and London. And the other one was a business uh, called Hannapin Marketing, who are well known in the US, uh, who specialize in performance marketing. So similar capability to what we already had in the business with Hannapin and a new capability with uh, Distilled. We didn't have SEO as a capability prior to that. So it's, it's, it was those two things. It was kind of one or the other. Either we're looking for uh, presence in, in geographical regions or uh, in vertical specialism. And then when we went for that, uh, you know, Distilled were perfect for us in a vertical context because they uh, you know, had a premium reputation as one of the finest SEO agencies in the world. So that, that kind of tied in super nicely. I think if they had been like, uh, uh, you know, to, to the other's point, done 20 different things, uh, then it would have been quite hard for us to, to kind of buy into the business or merge into the business because it's just more complicated. Really. Um, yeah, so, so you, yeah, you covered, you were looking for something quite specific then in that regard. Um, yeah, like in, in our M&A plan, there's a, there's a list of capabilities that we want to acquire and then territories that we want to enter. And our plan is principally capabilities based and it's, it's really ordered by what are the capabilities that we think would add value to our existing book of business, uh, you know, to create a kind of integrated offering so that we can tie the various parts together. So SEO was the first because we've been in performance marketing and SEO is a kind of core area of performance marketing and that was where we wanted to start. Um, uh, you know, the rest, let's say around uh, creative data, CRM, data science, um, uh, attribution, econometrics, 
and then a couple of other capabilities around you know, deepening our CRO capability, uh, plus obviously some some other than territories. Uh, so I think um, yeah, it's it's principally driven by uh, you know where is there opportunity to do better work for our clients? Like what and you know, it comes from client councils and client conversations is you know, which services would you love to see alongside the ones that we're already delivering? you know, for you at a high level and how can we integrate the rest of them? And then on, on top of the sort of ge geography and the service offering that they, the complementary service offering that they had, what, what were the other kind of things you were looking for when it, you know, I don't know how many that boiled it down to just that alone, but then did you then have to sort of, was it a gut instinct or what were the other things that you, you thought about when, when making those decisions? Yeah, this, I mean, it's a, it's a combination of factors, probably similar to how you would select an agency. And I think people can probably relate to that quite easily. There's a, there's a, there's a combination of capability and the kind of written number type uh, uh, stuff. But bigger than that, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of people connection and timing, right? Um, so, you know, it happened to be, in both instances, great timing. And in both instances, we built great relationships with, with the uh, with the founders and including, you know, even their advisors. So in, in both instances, uh, you know, great advisors that were aligned alongside the interests of the, the sellers, let's say, uh, and on our side as well, like great advisors, um, uh, you know, that, that knew or understood what we were trying to do and knew that like the people element of this was super important to us, right? It's, it's, it's easy to say, but um, uh, without the people, there is very little business. So um, now that was, that was probably one of the key areas and, and then obviously the performance of the respective businesses and their capabilities. So, um, you know, we, we, we got lucky in some ways that we, we scored top marks on all of those with those acquisitions that we've done so far. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of the rubric. Uh, maybe I'll share it with you afterwards as a you know, sort of table of these are different things that we're looking for. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, like, is it a great business with, with good people? And, uh, you know, are they clear about what, where they want to go next? Either, with us or without us and you know that's also fine by the way and maybe a side point but um there are options out there and um mm. you know there was it was it was through my own experience of um, um seeking investment or selling brain labs uh, that i kind of encountered these slightly awkward um moments where network groups wanted to know where i wanted to be in 20 years time and i was just it was just like well you know i think i want to be running a business but um a long time from now, so I'm not sure. Uh, sorry. Uh, whereas you know, the way that we've tried to approach it is like, look, let's just have an open conversation. Like we can support anything, much like we can support. Think so, LinkedIn. What you connected? How long ago? Anniversary. Put a mute there. Uh. <laughs> to mute him. <laughs> got, got some background noise. <laughs> there you go. It was probably meant I was talking for too long, so I'll. I'll, 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 I'll <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just got just got bored. Thought they'd have a cup of tea. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, yeah. So Jane, I mean, obviously, um, you know, I was going to ask you about, you know, whether you considered to build those skills in house. And uh, you mentioned there before you had a bit of a, a roller coaster where you you lost a lot of money on one tech project and you did one all right. And so, I guess you had some real life experiences before jumping into this. But was it ever a, a case back on the table where you think, well, let's build our own? development team, software engineers, how could we, could we do this without acquisition? Yeah, and we, we could have done, definitely. Um, like I said, we had like one terrible project, one great project. Um, so the learnings from that, we could have done it, but we just wouldn't have done it at the speed that I wanted to. Um, and, and also it was about then bringing Rob as an individual onto the board as our CTO. That was probably as important to me as the, as the acquisition as well. So there were both those things. But I've just seen one of the questions actually like, um, are there any lows of these acquisitions um, or collaboration with the agencies too? Like, I think the hardest thing is, has been the integration because we're not in the office. We're actually all coming back into the office from next week, but that's been really difficult. And also- um, Have you met each other yet? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they have, they have, but actually we did like a whole agency meeting on Thursday and I was like, I'm probably the only person in the room that's met every other person in the room. Uh, there were some people that kind of hadn't met people and that kind of thing. So, um, and that's part COVID and, and that's fine. But I also was interested about the, um, the expectations of the staff. So it was like literally about five days after the acquisition. 
and like some of the staff were like oh we just feel like two different businesses and i'm like it's been five days like you need to give it a bit of time like i don't know what they expected so i think obviously you know taking your staff along on the journey and um we didn't make too many we, we gave a lot of thought to the communication like who we communicate it to when you communicate it to um we at zeal we have we're, we're i'm very very open with my staff and i'm massively transparent so it felt a little bit like cheating on them in some way that i was doing this behind the back but obviously there are certain things that you can't you know you can't say it's going to happen and then it falls through so um uh, so, so yeah, it was uh, the, the comms piece was really important to me, um, but it was interesting because these people had never, never been through this, so I didn't really know what to expect. So it was interesting to see through their eyes, like you know, their, their expectations, and also this was my first, like any kind of acquisition or selling. So I was really careful to. Um, again to, to to ask the like my league like we use clarion who were just amazing and i was like i, I haven't done this before so i'm gonna need to you know you don't know what you don't know and i'm smart i'll pick it up quickly but you need to hold my hand a little bit and and tell me um so i, I kind of it was difficult like we had me and rob knew exactly what we wanted to achieve and why we wanted to do it and we were really excited and there was like a you know two week period because we did it really quick we did it in about three weeks um, and the first bit was great. It was like we were both on board. We knew what was happening. We were really excited. And then the lawyers got involved. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is really complex. And then we, the share issuing was more complex than I thought it would be. And, you know, there were points where I was like, oh, I just can't be bothered. This is too much trouble, you know, because it's, 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 it's difficult. And then... Um, did you already have, have an advisor that you were using or did you have to go and find one to do the deal? So I'd done a piece of work with an advisor prior to this actually him helping us get the agency in in, um, in shape for sale so i'd got like an advisor and I'm, i have a lot of like close friends who, who are agency owners or who've been through it before so i have like a lot of informal um support but yeah no i i hadn't got a clue and um rob he's from a like so he set up an agency sold it to wpp when he was 27 worked in wpp bought and sold agencies since then and does a lot of like venture stuff so this for him was like, oh, you don't need to worry about it. It's a walk in the park. And I was like, I, I, I will worry about it. And I will have, because I wanted to learn as well. So it was a whole, like, it was, it was a lot. It was fast, but it was, that's where I, um, that's where I want to be. And something that I'm constantly learning and that's it, new and exciting. But yeah, there were times where it does get frustrating because rightfully so, my advisors are saying, what it's a bit, I think it's a bit like a prenup, isn't it? It's like, oh, what if he cheats on you? What if he finds somebody younger? What if he does this to you? And you know, like, you have to, I get it, you have to understand that that could happen, but also it, it takes the magic out of it a little bit. But so it's quite a frustrating um, process. We actually signed, it, I think, like 11 30 at night on a Friday, um, just because, Going. yeah, just because it had been, but it, it took us like three weeks. So, um, so yeah, it's it's uh, I think kind of um, comms when even even if it's just collaboration between agencies, but definitely bringing app metrics in that comms piece. The staff was really important because I needed them to get on board, um, and it was hard when they weren't in the office, and, and so they couldn't see. They just had to take my word for it that you know the company was great and the people were great and the clients they were bringing over was great and Rob was great, and they just had to take my word for that because they hadn't seen it with their own eyes. So it was quite um, it was quite an interesting few weeks, really. But yeah, it was a bit like it takes longer than five days to integrate yeah. together. Like, give me a minute. <laughs> it does, yeah. It sounds it, and I guess a lot of you share that in common in terms of being kind of a first kind of flurry into the M and A world. And I guess James, when you, when you were kind of on that journey as well, um, I guess you had all of those possibly concerns, or how do you communicate it to your team and let, let's just start. What, what were you kind of? What were the important factors for you in in selling the agency? Um, I think I know what one of the answers might be, but uh, you never know. Well, I mean, me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously the commercials have got to be right, clearly. Um, and on that point, I think it's important that you you are very commercially aware um, in terms of what value your agency might, might bring. I think that's really important because, you know, it's not always about revenue. A lot of the time it is about, it is about profit. Um, and you hire, if you're high revenue, low profit, then obviously it might be a lot harder to, to get, um, some, some type, type of acquisition. Um, 
before I, before I jump into a couple of other things that I think are important, I think the one thing that I think is very important, uh, and especially for smaller agencies, um, if there's obviously smaller agencies on, on the line, I think one of the most important parts, if you want to sell your agency, is to be organised. Uh, startups tend to be quite unorganised, um, and it's absolutely vital that you have all of your ducks in a row, because when you come to actually talking to partners about potentially selling your business, they are going to dig and they are going to dig deep. Um, so, you know, filling up a data room, uh, which is where you put absolutely every piece of paper and digital contract, absolutely everything in. Um, we were very fortunate. I had two businesses prior to this, which were very unorganized. I went into this one saying, I'm going to be super organized. Um, so actually, when you get to that stage, if you've got everything all over the shop, it's, it's quite frankly, it's going to be a bit of a nightmare to, to sort everything out. So that's just a small one. Mm -hmm. Commercials, absolutely, I think are very important. I think, you know, you need to sell at the, at the right time. Um, I also think it's really important not to be greedy. Uh, in fact, I think it was Will who's mentioned this a few times and my brother-in-law who work, works in a similar type of business. You know, if you get a really, really good offer, take it. <laughs> because a year later, it might be a quarter of what you've been offered, um, obviously depending on the kind of trajectory of, of, of the business. Or a pandemic. Uh, sorry. Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, a lot, yeah, a lot of businesses who were going to sell have not sold now uh, for whatever reason. Uh, well, because of the pandemic. So yeah, I think it is important to, 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 to do it and do it properly. Um, I think the team sort of culture and the, the, the team ethos is really important. You know, when you're selling your company and, and you know, Jane sort of just mentioned this before, it is absolutely vital because if you sell your business and you get yourself into an earnout, which inevitably you will do, which could be from anything from two to five years uh, within that same agency, if you do the deal and all of your staff bugger off, um, you know, you're screwed basically. Um, and so it's really important, I think, uh, to make sure that wherever you're going, you know, there is a very, very strong cultural fit. In fact, we, part of, part of our process, we actually took our company values and overlaid them on Jellyfish's company values and they were almost identical, which was pretty mental. And going through the process, um, as Daniel mentioned before, you know, we spoke to both trade sales, so net agencies, and also we spoke to uh, private equity as well. And it's just the way that as you're going through that process, you, know, you really have to kind of work out um, how not just you, but your business are going to gel um, with that particular business. So I think, you know, getting the culture right is uh, it's, it's absolutely vital. Um, and I think the other thing as well is, um, again, Daniel also touched, touched on this, um, is, is complementary services. Like, it, I think it really has to be complementary. And there have been lots and lots of acquisitions that I have seen where there have been other businesses within that group that do a similar thing. And, you know, you just get completely diluted. Um, it can become very hard to hit goals, for example, especially if you sell to a big agency network. Uh, where, you know, you sort of go in there thinking, right, you know, we're going to get all this business and all the, all the big clients are going to come to us. Uh, but in actual fact, you know, that, that hasn't been the case for, for a few people that I've spoken to who, who sold their businesses. So I think it's a multitude of kind of being organized, um, obviously getting the commercials right. And uh, you need um, a specialist to help you with that. Again, like, as Jane mentioned, I'd, I'd never sold a business of this size prior to, to this. So I had no idea the, the, you know, the mechanics of an earnout. I had no idea really on how to properly value the business. Um, there were so many things. And I mean, don't get me started on kind of dealing with lawyers. Um, if we didn't have someone like Will, for example, in the room kind of explaining to us, you're doing this because of that, or you need this because of that, and you know, don't agree to that. I mean, honestly, God, like, I, haven't, I really don't know. Like, well, we wouldn't have done it quite yeah. frankly, or we would have signed a really, really bad deal, which does happen. So I think having the right um, uh, advisors uh, with you, I think is, is, is absolutely essential. Like just yeah. don't do it without a proper advisor. It's just not, not advised 
Not advised by an advisor. Advised yeah, um, so, so Dan, I mean, obviously we've spoken a bit about um, different businesses coming together. I'm interested, obviously you set up Brain Labs with a very clear philosophy and culture of what you wanted to create. Um, so now that you've got these two other agencies, how are you planning or currently integrating those businesses and maintaining that culture um, so that they are aligned and, and maybe tell us a little bit about the communication that you you went through with your teams. Yeah. Uh, just just before I do that, just picking up on a previous um, uh, point from James, just mm -hmm. a second, uh, the advisor piece. Um, uh, and actually, maybe just to add uh, on top of that, that if you are thinking about selling, then appointing an advisor, like even if it's a passing thought, then appointing an advisor really early on, they can be a critical part of that journey from, from very early stages. And, and I'd say from the other side, as a buyer, like we wouldn't buy an unadvised business because they have no idea what expectations to have from a valuation perspective. They might think that they're gonna get 20 times EBITDA and like this, that, and the other. Like when you go to a business, like if I see that they're advised by, um, by WY, Clarity Results, um, Waypoint, m and Advisor, there's, there's loads of good advisors out there other than Will, who's also brilliant. Um, uh, you know, if we don't see that, then it's quite difficult to say that they're going to know how to run out of process and that they're going to be prepared and they're going to have the right information. It becomes yeah. impossible almost as a buyer. So we, we, we bought a lot of unadvised businesses at WPP and we all, you always go into it thinking this is, you know, rubbing your hands together and we'll be able to kind of, you know, get, get a deal here. The reality is it takes twice as long. You have to explain everything to them as the buyer. Yeah. You need to take them by the hand and they're not nearly as well organized. So yeah, as a buyer, it's always way more efficient to, to, for them to be an advisor as well, for sure. And Will, um, Andy Headington's asked sort of, how much do they cost? <laughs> uh, <laughs> much. It, it could be a yeah, great can be. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> really, no, really, I, really <laughs> value pricing. <laughs> let, me, let me answer that for Will, because he can't say it with a straight face. Uh, <laughs> they, they, um, uh, that there's, like, as, a, as the business owner, the first time that you look at any advisor fees, uh, you'll look at it and, and um, uh, your heart will melt because you've built value in a business and then uh, you know, you, they're expecting a percentage of that. Right? It took me quite a long time to get over. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they have value to, to a process. Right? Like if, you, if, you, um, if you do it unadvised, you won't come out with as good an outcome. And I don't mean commercially, I just mean even strategically, right? Like having the right advisor to turn around and say, actually, you know what, that buyer is putting this in front of you, but they're not gonna treat you right down the line, or they're putting this offer in, but it's not a real offer because you know, they failed to deliver on deals when they've offered them before or whatever it might be. That type of advice is invaluable, right? Like if it, if it prevents a false start or an incomplete process, by the way, and you know, bear in mind, you know, Will probably has better stats on this, but a good half of transactions fail, uh, you know, that's a hell of an effort from a business to, to begin towards a transaction and then not reach the finish line. So um, I, you really can't just, question, I, it's just, it is what it is. You can compare and contrast between different advisors, but they earn their, they earn their way like, like we all do as agencies. I just, I, I just want to second that as well. I mean, yeah, when you look at it first, you sort of squirm. But <laughs> honestly, I, I would have, I, I would, I was, I literally, I wrote, Obviously, it'd be nice if it was actually a check, but just for, just so it sounds cool, I wrote that check with a smile on my face because it was worth every penny. I mean, it was literally worth every penny. Um, you know, it's the the, the price was uh, sorry the, the the cost against you know kind of the value that was given to us. I mean, it was it was an absolute no brainer. Um, so yes, the fees can look scary but i guarantee you you'll end up with a lot more with an advisor than without an advisor and not paying fees i mean that's 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 for sure and and someone else the guy was, um was it andy andy Heddington, yeah yeah um we actually the way that we work with will is we had um we had a retainer with will actually so retainer which was a again i think it, it changes so you have to speak to you have to speak to, to will about that but it was a, a you know a monthly retainer wasn't crazy um and then we obviously worked very closely with him across not just selling the business but you know getting us into shape which again i think is really really important as a small agency when you go out to market you have 
to make sure that you know all the not only your, all the questions that are going to be asked, but you know commercially you need to be in a in a in a good spot. And you know, um, you know, having that type of advice and looking at what we were doing and um, tweaking things, and again, just getting our house in order uh, for when we then you know hit the button, uh, hit the button, sorry, on, on actually going to market. You know that that cost again is is minimal. Um, you know, at the end of the day, when you, when you hopefully you know there is an event and you actually sell your business, it's all very small but you actually get value out of it anyway in the event of a non-completion as daniel said you know you'll probably be in a better spot anyway um you know if you do want to restart the process or you know if you decided that you know you want to continue for, for a bit longer so either way i think you know you'll you'll get value in it um you get what you pay for at the end of the day um, and i think if you pay for good advice you know you, you should you should be on top is there a is there a best deal structure? Uh, Alex Craven was asking. Um, maybe that's to you, Will. But uh... Uh, I mean, the, the best deal structure is loads of money up front and you get to walk away. But uh, it doesn't exist. I mean, the, the reality is, is, as James says, that you you know most most agency deals are going to run and run there now. Anything from kind of two to five years. They can be they can be all out acquisitions at one hundred percent, or they can be anything in between. Um, I think you know, generally speaking, um, anyone anyone selling their business in the agency space should ex should be seeking uh, a meaningful sum um, upfront uh, and, and an incentive that, that drives value towards the end of the deal. But the confusion with valuations is a lot of people will quote really big numbers, and that might be. The whole deal value over the whole of the three, four, five years, um, rather than necessarily the check that's written on on day one. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think that's a good point actually, because yeah, your some of the deals that we looked at, which were five years, years one to three, was actually quite low in terms of your earnout. But then year four and five, it really ramped up. But we, you know, the, we knew that the original growth stage was probably in those first three years. So actually, you've got to be really careful um, with kind of the, the, the size, uh, sorry, the length of the earnout as well, I think is, is important. You know, we, ASL obviously is thank, thankfully still growing strong, um, but with any, with any business um, of any type, you know, you have to start thinking about at what point does it get really, really competitive do we lose this kind of first mover advantage? Um, and it's just lots and lots of things to, 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 to be considered, um, which is why, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's what, wherever you think you're going to be in three years' time, try and do it in one and a half, I'd say. I think that there's a piece to add from my perspective, which is uh, the best deal structure is whatever suits you based on your circumstances at a given time, right? Like each agency owner is different and is at different stages of their life with different priorities. And in the way that we've done our deals so far, it's trying to lean into that, not have, you know, one universal structure that applies to all businesses uh, because, you know, you are a real person running a real, running a real business. And, you know, it's not for, well, from our perspective, it's not for the acquirer to judge anyone's circumstances about whether they need to pay off their mortgage or you know do this or that or whatever. There's, there's all different types of priorities. So in, in our deal structures, we haven't used earnouts. Uh, we've done uh, a mix between upfront cash, deferred cash, and then equity in in the top holding company structure, so that we're all aligned. Uh, and I think you know, Will's probably right in terms of you can look at the total amount and just, you know, be careful about how that, that compares to the kind of five year amount. Uh, um, but equally, like, you know, I think in the market at the moment, the, the banks are not in the most favorable position that they've been for a long time. Right? There's a lot of businesses in a recession that they don't know if they're going to collect from. So, um, you know, the capital is not as freely available as it might have been a year ago. Um, uh, you know, banks want to sort of secure their returns. So I think you'll see more deals done where there's uh, not as much cash up front, realistically, as maybe you've seen in the last three or four years. Probably, probably needs Will's input on it, like maybe more weighted towards deferred and, uh, you know, back end or equity type conversations. Uh, I think you'll see more like us and S4 that aren't doing earn out deals just because um, I think it's a hangover from the 
uh, the sort of traditional network type model where you could you could sustain an ecosystem of lots of different agency brands that all kind of semi competed with each other. Um, whereas I think what clients want today and like clients have to drive what the corporate structure within a business is. Uh, you know, they are looking for integrated services you know, to Mark Pritchard's point. Why am I paying you to navigate your complex organization? Uh, who are these account managers? Uh, you know, embedded within that quote is, is uh, you know, is, is a recognition that agency um, holding company structures are too complicated to deliver the services that clients need in a, in a digital age. So I think we'll see more integration and, and automatically with that. And maybe coming back to your original question, add story before we went massively off track. Uh, <laughs> Our aim is to integrate businesses, and that comes with some sacrifice, right? That's the hard yards <laughs> that, that, that James yeah, already described. Is this this agency model of the future that you sort of you allude to? Is that is that kind of where where you where you think we're headed? Well, it sounds very grandiose, but it's not really, is it? Like no. you know, the agency the agency model of the future, as I'm describing it, right, is an integrated agency type model where you build client teams around clients as opposed to departments. Is actually just what they use in the large consultancy businesses. So, you know, an Accenture, Deloitte, PwC, they're the most scaled service uh, based businesses on the planet and they're much bigger than any of the holding companies. So it's not, you know, it's not my invention. I want to be careful about uh, <laughs> what we say there. But those are integrated businesses, right? There's no complexity around what their name is. There's no internal politics. There's no different, you know, different priorities. There's no account management to navigate their complex organization. Uh, you know, they're built around the client and actually, you know, versus the agency ecosystem, uh, I think they put the client at the heart of their work as opposed to themselves. So there's no, there's no equivalent of the Cannes Advertising Festival for uh, management consultancies, let's say. Uh, maybe it's because they're boring, but um, <laughs> you know, equally, maybe it's because they're well-structured and, and well-run businesses. And I think you know, there's a lot to learn from that in the agency ecosystem. So, so you know, it's hard to integrate businesses, uh, really hard work. And I think probably Jane touched on it already, like um, the expectation from the business uh, uh, versus reality and then even down the line um, uh, you know the constant comparison uh, makes it really a, a tough ask but um, to me like you put the client at the heart of what you do and it needs to be integrated mm. and, and Jane just to, you know bringing you in in terms of advice for someone maybe embarking on this process or starting to think about it you know what advice would, would you give somebody um, in, in at this time um Somebody, what's, what's somebody that's, ne that's never done it before, like myself? Um, I think it's like anything, if you haven't done it before, it can sometimes feel like uh, it's really complicated and really difficult and only like really experienced, like super smart people do it. It's like pretty much anything, like it's actually quite simple once you, once you do it. It's like what I say to clients, like nothing that we do here is, is rocket science. We're not saving people's lives. Uh, we just, you know, do a good job of the specialist knowledge that we have. I'd say get find somebody that you trust, that you actually really trust to help you through the process. And then don't be scared about it. But um, I saw one question actually from Laura, which was an interesting question about how do you find these people to, to if you're so if you're looking on the acquisition route, because we're still now on it, we're looking to expand and we're probably going to be doing it geographically. Um, and I think that's a really good question because I literally typed into Google like agencies to buy um, in a <laughs> like geographical location like that's literally how I, how I started I quickly learned you probably shouldn't do that because I got a, a lot of uh, crap um, and again like advisors are a really good way of doing that um, but also I think what I liked about the app metrics acquisition is um, although it was done fast we we had a, the relationship started as something you could get out of and um, so you really we understood what they did and how they worked and the people and the personalities. Um, and then we kind of grew it from there. So for me personally, um, my next acquisition, I think will, will be similar. So I'll find an agency which um, we can collaborate on first uh, to kind of then maybe go down the acquisition route with that in mind. And actually a lot of the, a lot of the conversations that I was having pre-acquisition about selling Zeal, they wanted to do that with us. So it's almost like you become strategic partners. So their growth is, is helpful to your growth and vice versa. Um, but if anybody else had a better answer to that question, I would like to hear the answer. So how do you find like great agencies just to go by? <laughs> Contact well. Use, use, uh, an, use an advisor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think yeah. we, we've got like literally two minutes. So I'll just go to Dan and then James quickly in terms of, you know, advice, um, you know, valuable, you know, what were your most valuable learning experiences, um, you know, from this time? Um, and if you could share that with, with people who are looking to embark on the journey. After you, James. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, a couple of things. I think I think we've we've covered this a lot, but obviously, seek the right advice. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't stress that enough. It's so important. But finding an acquirer um, or for a purchasing, you know, these people speak to businesses all day long. You know, that is their job. And carving out commercials, um, getting your business in shape. I mean, they know exactly what you need and how you need to look. Um, and how you need to position yourself to potential acquirers. I think that's really important. I think the other thing, and actually Jane touched on this before, and Dan started to talk about it a little bit, um, is transparency with the team. And this part is really, we found this really, really difficult um, because you want to be transparent. And like Jane said, we were also very transparent with our team. But then at the same time, you don't want to say you've done a deal um, and then you don't do the deal. And then so it's, it's very difficult getting that balance of kind of um, getting the team, making the team aware, but then also telling them it, 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 it might not work. Um, for I think, per, to, be, to be quite honest, we did it really badly. Um, and you know it did have a, a short knock on effect on the integration because it was sort of, there was a lot lots of ups and downs and I think uh, I think we could have done more um, to have kind of had, had the team more involved in the process and I think that would have made integrating post acquisition a lot easier. Um, I mean, there's a, you do a whole session. On that. Dan, can I just jump in with you because I know Sorry. you've got to run. So final last words from from Dan before he. Oh, just second. I think there's been loads of um, uh, uh, pearls of wisdom, and I think I second what James is saying. Um, I think probably from my perspective, like we ran hard at like negotiating and uh, entertaining lots of parties, and you know, in 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 the end, uh, yeah, it maybe runs counter to what some of the other people are saying. Is like I think there's quite a small valuation range from a from a commercial perspective, like at the end of the day, and. Um, Actually, like I think it's more important to prioritize who you're going to be working with and what you're going to be working on. Because when I looked at the prospect of an earnout, like three to five years, it's just a hell of a long time, right? Like, that's, a, that's a mini working lifetime. And if you're not going to be happy doing that, you hear stories from other people that aren't happy doing that. It doesn't matter what the number is in front of you. Uh, it's not worth it. So uh, find something and someone that you really want to work with uh, or that will allow you a route out and, and chase that. Nice. All right. Thank, thanks, Dan. Um, well, look, I think that's what we've got time for. Um, I, I you know, appreciate everybody joining the call this afternoon. There are a couple of other questions that I've, I've jotted down. So I know Stephen and, and a few others I've written down. So we'll try and get back to you separately if the panel will, will um, you know, respond to those in their own time. Um, I only got one, one, two panelists left and I'm running out of people. But uh, thank you, James. <laughs> thanks, Dan. Thanks, Jane. All right. Cheers. I'll see you all on the next yep. event. Cool. Bye, guys. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Bye.